All right, we are back and we are locked in, ready to go for this offseason. Right now, it is the uh, first heat wave, real heat wave of the summer here in New Jersey, where it's just too goddamn hot to reasonably do anything other than just, you know, have an iced coffee, throw on your old summer playlist, which summer playlist is anything with like banjo, some pedal steel. If it's got some twang in it, it's, it's on the summer playlist. Throw yourself some Trampled by Turtles, maybe a little bit of Dwight Yoakam, maybe even some Robert Earl Keane. Jason Isbell's a must on the summer playlist. And if it's not, it doesn't have twang. Steel Drivers, that's got to be on there. And if it's not that, then it at least has to be Grateful Dead 1973 at Pauley Pavilion. Just throw that on three hours, boom, you're set. But we once again have an offseason where uh, I believe we are in a bit... Of, okay, so maybe the budget isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, uh, but we, we do have some decisions to make. So we have, like, Zach Neto, who do we want to buy him out for? Buy his, do we want to pay him $6 million for him not to be on the team, or we want to pay him $20 million for him to be on the last year of his contract? I'm probably opting to just having him on the last year of the contract, because he's still really good. I highly doubt we would honestly... Mm, that defense... That defense, and then the fact that the bat is decreasing, like he's getting minuses. Uh man. I mean, he he had a really good season. Now, now we know that he had a really bad postseason, obviously. He got benched for Cobb in the postseason. But the thing is, are we going to have an immediate replacement? Like, do we want to just play Cobb there every day in the regular season? Probably not. I mean, maybe we could and see how it goes. Uh, but we also have an option like, uh, is he in the top players for us here? I probably should have done a bit. Aiden Huzzy here. Aiden Huzzy could, could possibly just immediately slot in to our second base spot this year. Now, he does have the 60 uh, ability here, but it's kind of like Padilla, where it's like you look at his range, and you're like, why does he have the 60 ability? But, you know, I'm not going to argue with the 60 ability. He did not play in AAA last year, but Aiden Huzzy here did have really good seasons in A-ball his first year in Pro Bowl, and then in A last year in his second year in Pro Bowl, hitting a bunch of doubles here, a bunch of home runs, uh, you know, d d he had a decent walk rate. I guess he's 352 OBP, so he's not walking a ton, but he's oh, he's not striking out. He's not he's not walking a ton. What am I saying? He's not walking really at all, but he's not striking out really at all either because he has a 65 avoid K. Honestly, a similarish profile to Padilla here, where he doesn't strike out, makes a ton of contact, has decent gap. Not quite Padilla type power, but we could throw this guy in the lab or something this offseason to see how it goes. But uh. Honestly, I'm I might just be tempted to just like move on from Neto and have Aiden Huzzy be our second baseman this season, or at least uh, maybe Kaba starts as a second baseman and then Huzzy takes over, or you know maybe the other way around. We'll we'll we'll, we'll have to see because Kaba ideally he has that backup shortstop ability, so I feel like I would rather have Kaba be the backup shorts like the backup infielder, primary backup infielder, uh, and have Huzzy be the starter. I think I think that's what we're leaning towards right now, and that would open up some money for us to be able to. Uh, so if we don't bring back Neto, we could possibly. I mean, we're probably just going to do this anyway. With Chase Petty, he was he was really good for us, uh, and at you know a little over two million, I think he's worth bringing back. He was he was very solid for us. Uh, gave us a oh, ton of innings and sixty nine appearances. Nice. But, uh, yeah, so Chase Petty, we're just going to go ahead and do that. We're going to go ahead and bring him back for next season. Boom, $2 million, that's nothing. We can afford that. But Neto, I think I am opting towards just doing the buyout and not having him back next season because, I don't know, it's it's just like, obviously he had this really good season, but I just, I just don't think next year is going to be great for him. His ratings have declined to the point where he's like just 50s across the board instead of like 55s. He does have a 55 power, obviously, but he's never been a huge home run guy. Uh, and then his defense, after finally getting to the point where it was really good most of the time at second base, like he had this, uh, this after a bunch of like really weird seasons where he was like not good at second base, 
like, uh, what was it? I think it was like his first year, negative two. Then he had a six. Then he had like a, a, a zero. Then he had a negative. Then he had a six again. Then a six again. Then a five. Uh, and then last year it was down to a negative two. So, you know, the defense is going down. His bat has gone down. He is fragile, but he, we haven't had... I guess he's going to have a bit of an injury. Like, last year, he was hurt a bunch. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we're leaning towards not bringing him back. I don't want to spend an hour talking about Zach Neto here, uh, like I tend to do in the offseason, get off on tangents and whatnot, and just kind of never shut up. Uh, and these offseason videos are definitely other ones where I have to edit a bit more than the other ones because I just go on and on and on and on and on talking at my thoughts. And I'm also just realizing that we biffed it. We completely biffed it. I just completely missed the expiring personnel contract email. And we have all this personnel leaving, including a really good pitching coach and a really good trainer. Are we able to just bring them back? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. They hate me because I didn't bring them back. You gotta be kidding me. That's brutal. That's brutal. And, like, even these Miners coaches are pretty solid, but, you know, Miners coaches are replaceable. We, we can find similar guys out there uh, at these levels, I feel like. But, you know, overall, definitely not. Not great. I mean, the pitching coach is going to hurt, I will say. He was very good for us since 2026. He, he's been our, our pitching coach in this time where we've really we've really turned our pitching around the past two seasons he was our, our, in the world series season uh but you know we could probably replace him pretty easily uh maybe not pretty easily but you know he we could find somebody who maybe not maybe not he is legendary teaching pitching so that's going to stay uh, and then a trainer is obviously as well, because I you, you never find trainers with this much blue. And I just totally biffed that. That is totally on me. So we're looking at Nolan Shawnwell right here, and his ask has come down quite a bit. I've, I've done some little bit of tinkering here, but, uh, I mean, he's coming off this, this poor season, and this was in, like, the mid to high 20s at one point. Uh, and now it's below 20. Now, obviously, uh, our roster construction would have to uh we have to take that into account because uh if we don't bring back sean well what i'm planning on doing is playing aquino at first base because he just the, ob the most obvious first base option for us at the moment uh padilla at third and then we keep lesnar and van wingard in left and right that seems pretty straightforward and then we would have huzzy play second base if we don't bring back uh netto uh but if we do bring back sean well we might honestly have to play Padilla at second. We might do something where, like, Padilla plays second, Aquino plays third, uh, and Seanwell plays first. You know, Padilla, uh, we signed him long-term to be the third baseman, but it's like, you know, we might as well take advantage of the fact that he can play all these positions very well, at least what the game says. You know, last year did not have the greatest de season defensively, but maybe that's just, you know, he settled in. Like we, like we talked about, Neto, also for most of his career, had really good uh, defense. Or can I look at... Or whatever. He had really good defense like, a, like his whole career. Like th These were in like the 60s, because he was a former shortstop. Uh, and it took him a couple years to like really get his footing at second base and become like a solid second baseman. So, you know... I trust that Padilla will figure it out at whatever position we put him at. I'm just curious, what would his overall be at second? It would it would drop down quite a bit at second base. Where it's a 70 at third. But it's it's whatever. Uh, so yeah, we might do something like that if we bring back Sean Well, Which honestly, I'm kind of leaning towards doing. Because I, I, I could put Padilla in a corner in the outfield. Because he could play those really well. And he has the 75 great arm in the outfield. With a little bit less range. But uh, I like Van Wingarden. Van Wingarden was good for us last year. I like him. I like his bat. I like his defense. We're just going to keep rocking with him and Lesnar in the corners. And then center field this year, I'm thinking we're kind of leaning towards starting Fletcher Clancy as the center fielder. And then, of course, we still have Chase Brunson here in the mix, still on uh, league minimum. 
Uh, and then also Gavin Turley is still in the mix as well, although he is entering arbitration now, but it's only at 1.5. He is out of options, honestly, so we might try to trade him because he's kind of on the outs. We have Clancy and Brunson in front of, Brunson in front of him on the depth chart, and then even Gutierrez, I'd rather play him in the center just because I like what he brings to our team. And he's also arbitration eligible, but, you know, he has options. Uh, and he has an actual role on our team as opposed to Turley, who has just kind of been like our quad A center field type guy. Or, or backup center field, I should say. He's been our backup center field for the past two seasons, but he's definitely more of like a quad A type. Uh, and he, he has low leader, so he doesn't really have a role like Gutierrez does. So the fact that he has no options and he's kind of on the outs as the backup center fielder, we're probably going to look to move on from him this offseason. Uh, that's just a little center field talk there. But yeah, corners, we like what that is. I think this is what we're going to head into the season with. Uh, and maybe Huzzy has some more, uh, has the ability to, to, to cook more down in AAA uh, before coming back up and just rushing him straight from double A to triple A. I think, I think that's the move. And that's, you know, it never hurts to have depth. Uh, I don't really want to trade Huzzy. I, I think he is a legit piece for us moving forward. But we, I don't, I don't think we need to rush him to the big leagues if we have this situation where we bring back Sean Owell to play first base for us for a few seasons. Now he is fragile, uh, which is disappointing. Which is, that's definitely a recent thing. But, uh, you know, a bit of a down season. You know, am I crazy for being like, hey, he's 30. He had a down season as a first base, only bring power to your team sort of guy. Maybe. But he had a really good postseason. He was good in the postseason, so it wasn't like he he totally fell off. See, he had 80 plate appearances, 161 WRC+, plus, 7 doubles, 5 home runs in the postseason, 971 OPS. You know, he turned things around. So I, I don't think that Sean Well is cooked. I think he just had a down year. And I think a similar thing happened with Ohapi, wasn't it? Where his age 30 season... It was his age 29. Okay, so he had his age 29 season. He had the not great... Uh, not usual bat, just a pedestrian bat. But then he immediately rebounded. And plus, he still gives us a three war that season because of his defense. Whereas Sean Well is entirely here because of his bat. And, you know, I think I think we're leaning towards bringing him back. Now, I've tried to mess with this to be like, hey, we'll give you four years, we'll give you five years, and the fifth year is an option with a vesting option or something. And he just won't... He's not interested in, like, any of that. So what I'm thinking is we're going to dock him down a little bit on this stuff. Maybe like 18.2 on the first two years. We'll keep the opt-out, but then maybe we remove like the option on that year. And then we put like a vesting option on this year. And maybe bump this up to like 16.5. Because I doubt he's going to... Well, he's probably going to opt-out if I do... If I do... We'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe bump this up to like 18.5. 16.5 for the last two years. If I had to guess, he probably opts out of this, but we just we don't want to commit anything too too long term to a first base type. Uh, that's really what I'm what I'm concerned about. Put this on like 550, and let's see what he thinks of that. Okay, so he's he's really not interested in anything other than this. Like if I take out the opt year, and I go, like I'm just I just want to talk you down a bit. Maybe put you like 18.5 there. And then for these years, we drop you down to like 17. We take the option off this. Did not mean to do that. And then we put you on like a vesting for 550. Maybe this year is like 17.5 and this drops down to 17. See, now he's pissed. Now he's sad. I don't want to offer him something and he'd be like, ah, no, because... The thing about it is, what is the, the QO? 18.9. So, I guess we could give him a QO, and he'd probably accept it. Because he wants 19.4 for that first year. Maybe not. Maybe he would decline it because he wants more than that. But it is so close to it to where... 
I don't know. I mean, we might just give him what he wants. We might, like, try to maybe dock this down slightly. And we'll give him these two player options for these, these opt-in years if he opts into it. So he just basically has a two-year deal for 18.2, and then he has the ability to opt out of it entirely. And then he, if he opts into it, he has an, uh, an option for him in each of those seasons. I think that's what we're going to do. Okay, he doesn't even want that. So he just straight up wants this. Is that out of this world? Probably not. What, what can we do for moving around money? Because this is going to really limit our ability to sign anybody else. So like Smith Schauber's coming off the books... We have Soto entering the last year of his, like, guaranteed deal, and then he has two player options, which you'd have to assume he's probably going to opt into at this point in his career, where his age 36, age 37 seasons. I mean, who knows? Maybe he's still performing at this elite level, and he's like, I'm going to test the market again, but I, I doubt that happens. Uh, Logan Ohapi obviously is signed long-term. He does have an opt-out in 2035. Yuri Perez is signed long-term, also with an opt-out. Uh, in his contract after 2034. Uh, Zeto, we've talked about him. Uh, Zeto. Zach Neto, we have the, the option that we, we've decided. We don't know if we're going to bring back or not. We're leaning towards not because if we sign Sean Well, we're, we're not going to have Neto, a spot for Neto. Uh, Kaneda. I mean, it's just like he's good, but we he's a closer. So honestly, I'm I'm tempted to see if we can like move off of Canada. And then we have Healy too, who has two years of like 10.4. And I would like to bring him back because he was so good for us last season. Uh now maybe maybe not as good as I thought he was, but he had a free war. The ERA plus and the fit minus the you know, slightly above league average, I would say. Uh but he was he's solid. He's got a 65 overall as a starter. He's got these great ratings. If he puts up seasons like that, I feel like that's, you know, you take $10 million for that. Uh, we also have the Seal, who has one more year of arbitration. Uh, and we're planning on putting him in the rotation. At least right now, that is the plan, to have some starting depth. And it's only at 4.6 projected, so he's somebody who definitely I will take that in the rotation. We brought back Petty already. We're not bringing back Hagen Smith. That's going to open up money. Uh, Gutierrez, maybe we do move on from him. Because the thing about Gutierrez is... I mean, he's so valuable. He's the captain. He's the high leader captain. He's got the base running ability. He, he's a bit of a lefty feaster. Now, obviously, that's not great against uh, right-handed pitching. But, you know, he comes in there against lefties, does what he does. He plays really good defense. Even serviceable in center field give you a spot here or, here or there. Uh, and it's like, if we move on from him, the most obvious replacement on the roster for him would be Anthony Murphy who's a bit of a different player. He still gives you the really good corner outfield defense. He's not quite a captain, but he is high leader. So that's still pretty damn good. And he does not really give you the base running ability. And he has way more swing and miss to his game, where he's he's the guy who's going to come in, give you a few home runs here and there. Uh, and he is a bit more... He's a bit of a lefty feaster as well, but he's a bit more playable against righties, I would say, because he has the 60 power. Uh, but but way more of a swing and miss, and he's he's got a little bit more BABIP against lefties. Where forty five BABIP against uh, forty five BABIP against righties is really not what you want. So as far as like replacements for Gutierrez on the team, it's it's really Murphy or Espinosa, who is also high leader, gives you good defense in the corners. But his bat is really not what I would ideally like. I mean, he doesn't have the gap power and the speed. Uh, and he, he, he's been really good in the minors, but he was not good in AAA last year for whatever reason. As a bench player, it appears, because we have other guys who are better than him in the system at the moment. Uh, so it's like, we, we could move on from Gutierrez, but is that really worth moving on from him f to save 2.6? And then, you know, we still have three years of team control for him? Maybe... Uh, but then also, you know, we also have to think about the fact that, like, Aquino and, and Lesnar, where's Lesnar? 
Lesnar are guys who, like, Lesnar's entering the last year of uh, league minimum, and Aquino has two more years of league minimum. So, like, honestly, Lesnar at this point, he's a guy where you're like, hey, he's already willing to talk long term, and it's honestly not a bad deal. We might just go ahead and do this right now. Because this is, this, I mean, after the season that he had, I mean, it's, you know, it didn't light the world on fire, but with this type of power ability, you know, obviously we're committing a bit to a more swing and miss to our offense with Lesnar and Aquino, but I obviously would like them around long term and give us some huge power potential in our lineups. I mean, Aquino's got an 80 potential. Why would you not want that long term? Now, he hasn't really shown it in the big leagues yet. Uh, as far as like a consistent standpoint, I'd like to see him do it at least for one full season before I uh, commit to him long term. But Lesnar, I'm absolutely willing to commit to long term because he has this bat. He's shown that he can do it in the big leagues. Uh, now the strikeout's obviously a bit of an issue, but we pr we probably will throw him in the lab for avoid K again. Uh, and then he also has the really really good corner outfield defense, which obviously is is very valuable. Uh, and then he also was divisional round and ALCS MVP here this postseason. He's already a legend. I'm, I'm thinking we're, we're fan fave too. I'm thinking we're leaning towards bringing him back. The low financial ambition so we can get him really cheap. I, I think, yeah, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be fine if we sign Sean Owell to this deal. But if we sign Sean Owell... Oh no, we, I think we can we still do that because Sean Owell, it would knock us down to uh, 2 million... And Lesnar, for this upcoming season, his offer is only $1 million, at least the base here, which I probably wouldn't mess with. I'd mess with these numbers a bit, uh, but not too, too much, because this is extremely reasonable. If he develops up to what we think he's going to be, getting him for three free agent years at 11.6 is a fucking steal. Uh, but yeah, I think that we are going to lean towards doing that, because I just think this roster is good. We have the ability to do it. I'm 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 hesitant to mess with this at all because if I hit ask for a response, I'm thinking he's going to be like fuck you and I don't want to chance losing him on a QO. Maybe I maybe I should? I don't know. Is the thing. Cuz the thing is if we ask for a response and he gets pissed off and says fuck you and we have to QO him and then he and then he declines the QO, I would be open to trying to re-sign him in, in free agency, but the fact that he declined us and we pissed him off would make it probably to where he's impossible to sign, at least to start in the offseason. And he is that level of guy who's probably not going to last very long in the free agency pool. So, uh, we, we're going we're gonna to try this. We're going to, let's say, I mean, maybe I'm getting a bit too greedy here is the thing. It just, I really don't like these player options, is the thing. I would much prefer, I'm fine if he wants this option, but I would much prefer putting these on vesting. But as we've seen, even if I just take off these and then put on a vesting, it's, he's still like, no, I want what I want. So, I think we're just going to go ahead and do this. I think we're just going to go ahead, ask for a response, boom, 19.4 for two years guaranteed, at age 31 and 32, I'll take that. And then he has an opt-out. If he opts out, he opts out. If he opts in, then he has basically single-year opt-outs, uh, player options for himself. So, yeah. No one's showing him well. We're going to offer him that. And then we're also going to come right back to Chris Lesnar here. We're going to offer him a contract. And let's just say, I don't know. We, we bump this down to, like, 3.5. This to, like, 6. Maybe this to like uh, 10.5, and then these free agent years will all be 11.5. And then this will be, uh, this will be a team option. Why not? Yeah, I think that's, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, we'll ask her a response and uh, see how this goes. That's fine. Boom, that's a fair... We're doing this. Chris Lesnar is going to be around long term. Uh, you know, maybe maybe, maybe a bit ambitious committing to him with, with his strikeout problem right now, but 
we're willing to to bank on that at this, especially at this price. So Chris Lesnar, long term, him and Padilla are both locked up on very very team friendly deals. We're doing it. Boom. Chris Lesnar submitted. Another thing that we could possibly do here is Dave Peter has had so many great se- so many solid seasons of backup catcher play for us here. Two two back to back seasons of one point, basically one point two one point three WAR, triple digit WRC plus. He probably wants to start at some point because he is a 60 overall catcher. Uh, He's in arbitration now. Now, it's only 2.8, but I would imagine it's projected to go up quite a bit. Dave Peter, 2.8, 5.58. So, you know, he's arbitration eligible at this point. We've got three years of team control. Uh, We have, like, backup catchers who I would not be opposed to playing. At least I thought we did. Yeah, so, like, somebody like Greg Gillespie here... 12th round pick of ours out of FIU. Really good avoid K contact bat. Decent gap pad, but no speed to go with it. Solid framing and blocking here to go with some high leader ability. Never going to be a great bat for you at the major league level, but he's he's backup capable. So yeah, we don't really have uh, a guy who is obviously this level of backup catcher, but like Peter wants to start. He is durable. Like he's a valuable valuable player it's just we aren't going to be able to take full advantage of what he is as a player as a durable really good defensive okay offensively catcher because we have logan ohapi signed long term uh logan ohapi we have him at least through 2035 so at least three more seasons that he has the opt-out which i would imagine he's probably going to opt into so i would imagine that we have him through 2037 i would say uh, which we signed him to do. Now, maybe uh, these last few years of this deal, he's not like Logan O'Hoppy anymore, but that's still quite a few years away. That's also, we don't have Dave Peter under team control at that point anymore. And, you know, really good catchers are valued around the league. So I feel like we should be trying to move off Dave Peter and get something for him because we just don't have the ability to take total, get the total amount of value out of him is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and I think that's just that's just smart team building in my mind. Uh, so we'll pro- we'll probably shop him around a bit, see what we can get, uh, and then you know we can patch together a backup catcher with either somebody in the system or you know sign somebody in the off season. We'll have to see how things go. But then, like I said, we're also going to be moving on from Gavin Turley. We'll see what we can get for him. If nothing, we'll just non tender him. Hagen Smith, same deal. We'll see what we can get. If not, we'll non tender. Mike Lilly, same deal. If I had to imagine, he's probably a guy who gets nothing coming off this really, really bad season. Uh, You know, I still think he's, like, decent, but I just... He's arbitration eligible now. He does still have three options, but it's, like, two million, and I don't really want to pay a guy two million to give up this type of of a production, even even when he was good for us. You know, it was good, but, you know, we can get that out of of guys much cheaper. We have people in our system who can can give us numbers like that. Uh, So, Lily on the outs here. Mike Vasile... We'll, we'll give him something like a couple hundred thousand less than this. Andrew Healy will like probably... We're not going to be able to re-sign him long term. But uh, yeah, we're not going to be able to re-sign him long term. But we'll we'll see what we can do with him. We can, we can probably at least bring him back for one season, I would imagine. And then Eric Rose is definitely getting to the point where he's a bit more of expensive as a reliever. Uh, projected to get 2.6 in arbitration, which is, you know, usually around that cutoff. But he is, like, that level of reliever where I'm like, this dude's developed so much where he's got 65 stuff, he's got 60 home run suppression, he's got 60 control, he's got two really good pitches with a solid sinker. He even gives you starting ability with this 35 stamina. I don't want to move off of Eric Rose. I think he is a legit piece for us. We're going we're gonna to pay him through arbitration. We're not going to give him a long-term extension, but we're at least going to give him like a one-year deal for like a couple hundred thousand less than this. All right, so just a quick little look through these trainers right here. The guys that we're thinking I want to go with are either Jared Hannenberger here, who gives you the legendary prevent arms and prevent legs. Uh, only okay back is kind of not great to me, but then he, he you know, he has the rehab good back, re- good rehab back, good rehab other uh, the rehabbing arms is poor, which is what we're really going to miss with the guy we, we biffed it and did not bring back because he had, like, so much... He was really good at rehabbing and preventing injuries. Uh, and really the only... If we want to go that balanced route, the guys who stand out to me for balanced are probably, like, this dude. 
Juan Alvaz, who has the legendary rehab back, only fair arms, but outstanding rehab other. But then he's just got, like, good preventing legs and back and an excellent preventing arms. Probably prefer... Or there's, or there's like, somebody who only has fair legs. He's excellent preventing arms, legendary back. This Chris Lundquist guy is, like, decent... He's got the excellent legs, good arms, but I'd, I'd prefer to prefer a guy who has legendary arms at least. So we might just go with Hannenberger here. Uh, maybe I'm like a shorter term thing and see how it goes because I just think that that's probably our best bet. I thought we had a really good trainer and that's that's such a huge bummer to me that I biffed that because it was... It, uh, I mean, he was good for us. He was he, uh, really, I mean, I've, I've never had a trainer like this. Especially, like, first trainer after Rick Jamieson. Alright, so here's what we're rocking and rolling with with the Dev Lab. Uh, we've got eight guys in here. Amari Collar. We're gonna try and increase his pitch movement. Because, you know, he's, he's looking like he's mostly just a fifth starter at this point. But if we can get this movement ticked up a bit more, I would definitely feel a bit better about him long term. Uh, especially this home run suppression paired with this fly ball rate. He's got the high work ethic, so hopefully we can get a good uh, success out of that. Also, Chris Aquino, we are going to be trying to go for plate discipline with him. I was thinking about maybe going avoid K with him and Lesnar, uh, but I opted to go with I to be like, you know, they're going to strike out a lot. You know, Aquino's got 40. I mean, getting up to 45, you know, maybe that's worth it. But I felt like maybe getting a big boost to I would also be quite helpful. Because uh, he's already got the really good BABIP. If he can get the the walks up as well with uh, the, the big power, hopefully Aquino can get that going for him and become... Like I said, he's, he's not really a true a three, three true outcomes guy because he has the big BABIP. But, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see if we can get the I with Aquino. Uh, and then I opted to do the same with Lesnar. And it's like, you know, maybe we can get a huge jump of eye and get his walk rate up a ton. But also, like, he does have a strikeout issue. But the thing is, I don't want the strikeout thing to, like, backfire on me. And it's like, oh, he was focusing too much on that, and then his power ticks down. And, like, say his power goes down to 65 even, suddenly I don't like him as much long term. But maybe I should still like him, but... You know, the fact that he has, like, deep blue power with 75 potential is what I like about him. And, you know, 40 avoid K, it is obviously... I think we're just, we're just going to do that. We're going to we're gonna go avoid K. So, you know, now that, now that I'm talking that out loud, we are going to go down to Lesnar. And we're going to throw him on his two-strike approach here. So he's going to go in for avoid K. Uh, and then we also have Mike Hoskins in here. Because we're just trying to get this movement up. He's another guy like Collar, where he's got the big control, but his home run suppression needs to go up. He is the ground ball guy. His stamina actually went down recently, which is not good. His potential went down to 55. Uh, you know, we we hope he can figure it out, because this is a guy we want to be a part of our team long term here. Uh, Mike Hoskins in the dev lab for movement. That's what we opted for with him. Pair well with the uh, the ground ball stuff. Uh, and then Ben Urbanowitz. Also, uh, I know maybe it's not the smartest thing to put a guy with low work ethic intelligence in the dev lab. But we did have a success with Andrew Healy, who had low work ethic in the dev lab. Uh, I believe, what season was that? We got him... And... Yes, outstandingly completed his training to improve his pitch control. Uh, so we, we got a big success with a low work ethic guy before, so hopefully we can get that again here with Mike Hoskins. Uh, then we also threw in Ben Urbanowicz, who is a guy we took in 2028. He was a ninth round pick for us, made the jump to double A last year, and was absolutely phenomenal. 166 WRC plus, 5 war with the Rocket City Trash Pandas, going to be starting this year in triple A. Has some really good outfield range, really good base stealing capability, really good avoid K contact that with some gap power to go with his speed. We are going to try to tap into his power. 
because I'm looking at this guy's bat and I'm like, this is Padilla. This is Padilla all over again. If we can possibly get a big boost to the pa- to the power like we had with Padilla. And I know, I know with the, the amount of success that we had with Padilla, it was like a once in a, not a generation thing, but it was a very rare thing to happen to get a 10 point increase in power. But who knows? Maybe it could happen. You know, might as well swing for the fences here. And that's what we're doing with Urbanowitz. Uh, and if he does have a big success like that, all of a sudden, we've got a bit of a logjam in the corners, but, you know, it's we'll, we'll take it. We can trade guys, we can open up spots, we can have super depth. We, we are about building a team here, we're about building a goddamn dynasty, we're trying to win 90 plus games every year. Uh, having guys like this in AAA is part of that, having a really deep team. Uh, then, we also threw Aiden Huzzy in. Also trying to tap into more of this power. Now, it already is at 50, but who knows? Maybe he can jump up even more. It's the only thing with growth potential on his bat. So I was like, let's just try to make his bat even better. If we want him to eventually be our starting second baseman, I would, uh, you know, I would feel good starting him right now. But if this jumps up even more, man, we are cooking with gas. Then we are also threw in Fletcher Clancy. The only thing... With growth potential was BABIP, and I'm like, hey, let's try to get you some more little, little little BABIP to your action. You already don't strike out. You already have good gap power. Let's try to have some uh, some BABIP singles going your way to go with your speed, your gap power, your, your never strike out, and your really good defense. And all of a sudden, you're looking even more intriguing as a starting center fielder for us this upcoming season. Now, I know he's not, like, elite in center field as a starter player, as a starting player, but... I, I love this profile. I've talked about it a billion times. I love the gap power with the speed, the 70 range. He was good in the postseason for us. Him and Brunson I both like, you know? If, if we have a center field mix of him and Brunson, I am totally fine with that. Uh, it's not going to make or break our team because they still play really good defense. And then we also threw in two more. Or We, we talked about Lesnar. We changed him to avoid K. We're going to try to tap this into 40, maybe even get a huge success and it goes up to 45. Who knows? But uh, Chris Lesnar, we, we want to cut down this, this strikeout rate because we want him long-term. We want him hitting bombs here with Aquino. And if we can get this strikeout rate down to like 35 34%, I'd feel much better about it than, you know, a 37% strikeout rate. I'm not expecting anything crazy, but, you know, not, not close to 40. That's all I'm asking for. And then... I didn't really, I didn't really see like an obvious another guy to throw in, so I was just like, hey, let's just let's 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 just do something we've never done before. Chase Tucson, you remember this guy? He won the reliever of the year in the Southern League because he had a 1,251 ERA plus in 47 and a third innings pitched down in Rocket City. Uh, just incredible season for him. And he just have a two-pitch mix where it's like one really, really like elite changeup, a cutter, which is pretty solid. And he's got the 65 stuff. So I was like, hey, you know, it'd be cool if he had another pitch and he has the 35 stamina. So who knows? Maybe he's able to add another pitch and it ends up being good enough to where all of a sudden he is a starting possible option or at least the guy who can give you more of like a stopper roll sort of thing because he does have the 45 control. But if he adds a third pitch... All of a sudden, it's like, hey, man, you know, maybe he's possibly like a legit star, a legit like stopper, can give you multi innings in the bullpen sort of guy. Uh, hopefully, that works out for us. Now, it is very hard. It is a very, very. If we just take a look here, just to give you an idea, it is a very hard difficulty for the uh, the dev lab, which. You know, we, we've been doing the hard stuff with, like, Clancy and Huzzy and Urbanowicz, and we've, we've done hard before. But this is the first time we've done a very hard-to-improve thing, I believe. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah, this is definitely the first time we've done a very hard thing. Uh, so... You know, maybe we maybe it pays off, maybe it doesn't. But we're gonna we're gonna take a swing here with a bit of like a fringe reliever sort of guy and see if we can bump him into being like a legit dude for us in the pen. Oh, I should also mention he has the high work ethic ability. So you know, I'm hoping that also plays into the fact that I wouldn't have done this very hard thing with a guy who has low work ethic. You know, I would not have thrown Mike Hoskins in for, a ad ver- for an ad pitch very hard difficulty. 
I would not be doing that. But with Tucson, I felt like it was worth a swing with him to try to elevate his game. Alrighty, we have gone to the offseason and we are now here at the start of the 2033 campaign. But before we obviously head into the season, it's time to go over everything that happened in the offseason to get us to this point. So we'll start things off with a couple trades we made here. They were pretty minor, but we did get some interesting pieces back in return. First, we sent Gavin Turley to the Colorado Rockies. He started the year on their big league roster. He might be their starting center fielder. You know, they got a really good center field range guy playing for them. Uh, and we, we basically, he, he was on the outs on our team. That's why we traded him. He had no more options. We have guys that we like better than him. So I was like, let's just get something for him. And we got a pretty interesting package. We picked up uh, Spencer Browning here, who is an interesting like depth utility guy. He's in AAA for us. He has options. We used one of them. Or, yeah, it should say we used one of them this season because we literally just sent him down. But uh, Spencer Browning, interesting speed profile. Has some green in his bat profile. Can play a solid defense in the infield and in the outfield as well. Maybe spot you some center field if you need him there, but mainly a corner. Uh, interesting depth piece. I always say interesting, but he is. He's an interesting player. Uh, and then we also got former number one overall pick Josh Tackett. They just have not been able to really develop this guy for whatever reason. Uh, and I think that he getting our system is like the perfect guy for us. He's got the extreme crown ball. He throws super hard. He's going to be in our bullpen here to start this season. But, you know, he is a guy who maybe eventually can give us some starting potential if he can tap in to a bunch of this growth. Hopefully he can do that. But, you know, the Rockies, they, they gave up on him. They offered him to us, and I was like, hey, we'll take him. And if you're wondering, like, there's no way this guy was the first overall pick out of Austin P. State. If you remember, I definitely do that. I, I talked about him when he went over first overall, and they, they gave up on him, apparently. So... Uh, let's see, yeah, where was he taking? Here we go, yeah, number one overall by the Rockies in 2030, and uh, he just never really did much against them, never really did much for them, I guess, and they just, they just traded him. So they were like, hey, we don't think this guy is going to be good for whatever reason, uh, and we got him in return, so he's going to be in our bullpen here to start the season. Really good personality as well. I'm very excited about this. Very excited to see what he can do for us. Uh, and then we also traded Hagen Smith because he was arbitration eligible, uh, and we just didn't really have. I didn't really want him back. You know, he was fine for us last year as like a minimal single inning lefty guy. But I mean, he's he's whatever. So we sent him to. Uh, funnily enough, he ends up on Colorado. But we sent him to New York along with just like a throw-in piece to make the deal work. Uh, for Eric Schmidt, another, you know, like depth infield sort of guy. Can play some corners for you, but not really with the 30 range. I would say he's definitely not a corner outfielder, but he has the error in the arm. He's definitely like a like a depth infielder guy. Uh, we have a lot of depth infielders. Uh, it's, it's whatever, you know. The, depth is never a bad thing, especially when you have guys with options like this and Browning. He's a lefty bat to have in the system as well. They're, they're guys that are de definitely going to be around for us here for the next couple seasons. We also opted to bring back Mike Lilly on a one-year deal. I just felt like it was, you know, worth just bringing him back for whatever. He's in AAA to start this season. We'll see how it goes for him. But, you know, his leash obviously is not very long. If we need somebody to come up and pitch for us, he can possibly do that. But, you know, after last season, the way his ratings are looking right now, it might be, it might be over for uh, Mike Lilly. And then I mentioned that I was going to trade Dave Peter. I just kind of didn't do that. Well, I didn't. I just straight up didn't do that. He is our backup catcher once again. His overall is now 55, but it's, it's high right now, but it's, it's whatever. I just, you know, I just didn't really like any of the offers out there that I thought uh, that we could get for him. I just didn't really see anything that was like really, really enticing. So I was just like, hey, you know, Hoppy is getting older. You know, maybe we could use a guy like this as a backup. He's only making uh, 2.7 this year, projected to go up to 6 million next year. So, so next off season, definitely a potential. I would say a high potential that he gets traded next off season. But I would, I just figured, you know, 2.7 million. 
that's plenty fine for a backup catcher. And he's been solid for us in that role. So, you know, I figured you might as well bring him back for another season. Uh, but we did what we did do is when we were shopping him around, there was an interesting prospect who I was really the only guy who was interesting to me. Uh, but I felt like we could get him for somebody that wasn't Dave Peter, and I was correct. We basically did a little bit of a prospect swap here with the Atlanta Braves. We traded Bobby Camp who was a pretty high pick for us, second round pick in 2029 out of a New Jersey high school, Bobby Camp. We sent him to the Atlanta Braves, big bopping first baseman type. Hasn't really done anything in the in the, in the minor leagues, but you know these guys take forever to develop uh, when you take them out of high school, so who knows? He could be in the big leagues by the time he's 25. Who knows? Maybe he's a solid player. But I just didn't really, I just didn't really see a future for him with with us. You know, he's a first baseman. That's what he is. Uh, so I was fine giving him up. And then we also gave up this shortstop, more so a second baseman at this point, Nelson Arango, who is an international amateur for us, I believe. Yes. At least I think. Yeah, he was an international amateur for us. And uh, he, he, had some, he had some promise at some points, but he was, you know, I just, he's, he's whatever. I was fine giving him up, even with the high work ethic intelligence. He could be a player someday. We'll, we will find out. I have them both on my uh, interesting former player keep an eye on list. Uh, so yeah, we sent them to the Atlanta Braves in return for who what I'm thinking is going to be our long-term center fielder, uh, Clancy and Brunson. I'm fine with playing them there right now, but long-term, it's this guy. Alondro Canalate, the Venezuelan lefty-lefty center fielder insane speed profile with with this with the bunt for hit as well never gonna hit for power but he's got the eye potential he's got the gap potential he's got the contact potential line drive hitter as well so he's not a big ground ball guy good intelligence low financial ambition and the 80 grade center field range folks this guy could be an absolute demon for us in center field long term and we are looking for him to be that. He's starting the year in double A because he's only been an A ball. But we are going to be rising him up to the system as uh, as we see fit. You know, Maybe he's a big league center fielder for at some point this season. Maybe it's next season. But uh, Conalate is definitely somebody who we are very, very excited about here in the system. And then you might be also seeing that we decided to... Uh, we chickened out. We chickened out on the extension for Nolan Shawnawell. But he did accept the qualifying offer for 18.9, which is fine. Uh, you know, we, we wanted him back, but I just didn't I didn't feel comfortable giving him that long-term deal. So we gave him the QO. He accepted it. He'll be back on our team for the season. We'll see how he does. Uh, Zach Neto declined the QO, and he ended up signing with a division foe in the Los Angeles Dodgers. So we will be seeing quite a bit of him this season, and we'll be keeping tabs on how he does in his first season, not in Anaheim, but in the other Los Angeles team, uh, you know, name-wise, that is. And that was really all we did this offseason, because I just felt like our team is already really deep enough. We have a lot of, like, dudes that I just think are in place, and we don't really have any any spots that I could improve that I don't have, like, already an immediate replacement in AAA, basically, that I that I wanted to block. So I just didn't block anybody, and we're just rolling with essentially the same team heading into this year's season. Uh, I did pump up a ton of our budget and our draft budget and our scouting because we had a bunch of money left over. So I was like, hey, let's just do that. And uh, yeah, so we got $35 million in the player development budget, and let's just take a look at what this team looks like. One thing I should mention before we do that is the injured list. Eric Rose is going to miss uh, a big chunk here to start the season. He had an oblique strain very early on here in spring training. So unfortunately, uh, he's going to miss four to five weeks here to start the season, but he will be back eventually. And obviously, he is a big part of our bullpen. But taking a look at the current Pitching staff, one through five, it is Justin Lampkin, Yuri Perez, Andrew Healy, Mike Vasil, and then Amari Collar is the fifth starter. And Amari Collar definitely not looking like he is a long-term uh, like stud for us. He is the fifth guy. That's just what he is. He's been solid in that role the past two seasons. 
but uh, the ratings just keep going down for him. He's gotten more minuses uh, in August at the end of last season, and then he got more minuses in spring training this year. His control has gone down, which has always been his calling card. Now, he still has a bunch of green in the profile, but, you know, th this guy, when we took him, we thought he was going to be like a legit stud for us in our system, and he just hasn't panned out to be that, unfortunately. But he's starting the year as our fifth guy. We'll see how things go with him. Uh, as far as the bullpen, it's Kaneda in that closer role. Once again, Chase Petty is a stopper. Chris Lavonis is a stopper because usually it would be, it would be Rose. Uh, I've been rocking three stoppers, but we're going to rock two stoppers while Rose is out, and we're going to give Lavonis that shot as uh, him and Petty. I thought about maybe moving up Schmidt or uh, Shamar here into the third stopper role, but we're just going to keep them as middle relief. Use more often both secondary stopper roles because both of these guys have, at least Schmidt proved last year that he's he's a solid option in the bullpen for us. And then Shamar was really good, one reliever of the year in AAA last season, and he's going to be a big piece of our bullpen here this year, at least to start the season. Uh, Josh Tackett, like I mentioned, is in our bullpen as well. And then we also have as the lone lefty is Mike Hoskins in the middle relief slash specialist role. Specialist role. Uh, yeah, so basically we're going to be looking this season in like if Collar struggles, Hoskins probably going to go into that spot. We have some other options down in the minor leagues that we can call up, but this is the rock, this is what we're rocking with here to start the season in our staff. And then taking a look at our lineups, very similar to what it was last season. It's the same thing against righties and lefties, just very minimal differences, basically in the pinch hitters. Uh, but yeah, righties and lefties, the lineup is Juan Soto DH, Logan Ohapi catching, Juan Padilla at second, Lesnar in left, Sean Noel at first, Aquino at third, Van Wingarden in right, Fletcher Clancy in center field with Brunson backing him up, and then Alvaro Dowd is our shortstop hitting ninth. Now, I do think that Dowd is not going to have this five war. This is definitely going to drop down, I feel like. But we have plenty of bats in our order that are going to pick up the slack for if, if Dowd does not have a five war season again. The majority of this was his glove as we know, uh, but he definitely had a solid hitting season. But, you know, we're, we're, we're expecting a big jump at uh, at third base in the power from Aquino. We're getting a full season of Aquino's bat in our lineup. He was, uh, I think he had a good, yeah, he had a solid ended spring training with an 858 OPS. We will take that. And he has gotten a bunch of scouting bumps here as well, as you can see, at the end of last season and here in spring training. Current eye went up, current defense went up, current gap went up, his overall went up. We love to see it. I'm expecting big things from Aquino this year in the lineup with Chris Lesnar. It's Chris, yeah, it's both Chris and Chris. Uh, and then obviously Padilla, he's our guy. He's playing second this season, but he is more than capable of playing second base. Uh, you know, oh, Hoppy is going to do his thing. Sean Wells back. Van Wingarden is a solid bat we expect to have. And then I, 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 I think that Clancy can be a solid, solid hitter with a full season of him in the big leagues here with the 70 range. So that's even a uh, upgrade on Brunson's defense last year, who was a solid center fielder for us last year. So, you know, we, we, we like who we're rocking with here. And then obviously Gutierrez is the backup corner with the secondary backup center field. And then we went with Chalowski as the backup infielder because both him and Kaba had three options. And I just thought that Chalowski's profile is better than Kaba's. If you take a look at him here, he's got the 60 BABIP with the 50 gap and then the 50 eye. And then the speed profile can play all over the infield very well. But the thing is, his contact is more so in the BABIP where if you take a look at Kaba here, his contact is more so in the avoid K, and I talk about all the time how I prefer to be in the BABIP. Uh, so I think Chalowski is just the better bat. He might even be the better defender overall. Uh, hopefully Kaba doesn't get claimed, but if he does, it's whatever. You know, he helped us out last season, but uh, we're going to be rocking and rolling this season with Chalowski as the backup infielder. And then I'll just straight up say it this year, the... Uh, the, the player development was not really anything happened for us this season. Nothing, nothing good. 
a couple we had a couple poor ones but nothing really too uh it, it didn't have like a huge effect so uh with our first round of guys we put in there we tried to improve collars uh movement i ended up putting in uh J josh tackett as well once we traded for him he had no improvement literally the only improvement in the first set of guys was that chris lesnar did indeed improve his avoid k writing by uh less than five so you know it's still 35 but it's probably like 38 or something like now you know it's it's almost 40 he improved it a little bit so hopefully he can cut down this to be like 35 percent I would, I would enjoy that. You know, it's still not great, but anything subtracting from 37% strikeout rate is going to help us out here. And then for the second round of improvements, because Tackett was added in one day after the rest of these guys, we could only throw in seven for the defense uh, round two of improvements. And none of those guys really were successful either either. Huzzy had a poor program, but luckily there were no, no, no noticeable changes. Same with Harrington, no noticeable changes. The rest of these guys had no improvement. And then Kanalate, we improved his base stealing because it was a little bit lower than this. But you can see here, it, it improved by less than five, actually. So uh, Kanalate, you know, speed profile. We, we were trying to get the stealing ability up to like a 75, maybe even an 80, who knows. But it's still obviously very solid already. And then we also... Uh, improved Chris Lesnar's base stealing ability as well, but his improved by five for his stealing and his aggressiveness. So his is now up to 60, and maybe we can see some more stolen bases this year from Chris Lesnar. And then I also forgot to show the award winners for the 2032 season. So we're just going to quickly go through just the main ones. So uh, you can see here the American League MVP was actually... Uh, Tyron Lorenzo, who was the catcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, who you can see actually signed with the Atlanta Braves in this offseason to a big deal here. Uh, clicking on the wrong thing here. Pretty big deal through his age 35 season. Has an opt-out after three years. He's the Braves catcher. Big power bat. Really good defensor, de defensive catcher as well. Even has some really good speed as a catcher. So this guy, he's now in Atlanta, no longer in our division. The National League's MVP was Quentin Young of the Kansas City Royals. He put up a uh, six-war season, round up to seven if you want to go 6.6, .6, with a 158 WRC+, plus, 39 home runs, led the league in home runs, ribbies, WRC+, plus, slugging OPS, all around insane season, a huge BABIP, but, you know, you would expect that for a guy uh, with this 60 BABIP rating and winning uh, an MVP. Uh, and then... The NL Cy Young, who else but Andre Samora of the St. Louis Cardinals. He now has four Cy Youngs, and he is tw he was 25. He's 26 now entering this season. Uh, oh, my God, I just saw this. He's going to be out for the year. Andre Samora, four straight Cy Youngs in his four seasons here in the big leagues, and now he's going to miss the uh, his fifth season, so he is not going to have five straight Cy Youngs. That is a bummer for them with a torn flexor tendon. Uh, hopefully just for the sake of the storyline of this guy, he does not drop too much because this guy is just fun to look in on at, every, at the end of every season. Just be like, he put up another eight war a year. What do you want from the guy? <laughs> and then the American League Cy Young. Unfortunately, Yuri Perez did get out beat, did get beaten. He finished second to uh, Jesus Ramirez of the Oakland A's, but we did get we did get the edge in them in the postseason. So you know, Jesus Ramirez, hat tip to you, but you know, we beat you guys in the postseason. So who's the real winner? The top rookie in the American League went to DJ Huber of the A's. Once again, they're topping us in the awards as Alvaro Dad and Chris Lesnar get second and third. You know, Huber had a very, very good season for them, but it wasn't like, you know, I, Alvaro Dad had a five war. You're telling me he can't run rookie of the year over that? I mean, come on. Chris Chris Lesnar had a, I mean, he had a three war if he ran up, but, you know, he was, he was, he was incredible. You're telling me, you know, that, I would say Huber had a better season than Lesnar, but, but come on. Dad had a five war. Give him the rookie of the year. Come on. He needs some he needs some hardware up here. And then the only other awards where we, where we had guys getting him was Chris Lesnar did end up getting some hardware. As you might have been able to see, he did win the gold glove in left field. Nothing else for us uh, went our way, but Chris Lesnar does indeed get a gold glove in his first big league season with the uh, 
the 10ZR in left field. Another thing that I should mention is if we take a look at the NL Gold Gloves, look who it is, baby! Dylan Carlson! And this guy had a crazy season. He signed in the offseason with Boston here. Another one-year deal for Dylan Carlson, 5.8. We love that his career's still kicking around. He's, uh, you know, 34 now, and his defense might be taking a hit this season. But he put up another solid year at the plate. And defensively, you can see here, the Tigers did the thing once again where they were like, hey, let's put him in center. And it did not go well. <laughs> Who could have seen it coming? And then they were like, okay, let's pivot and put him in left. And then, boom, he wins the left field gold glove in the National League, only playing 76 games at the position. That's just how much respect he has in a corner now in this league. And in case you're wondering where the big fish of this offseason went, A.J. smith Shaver, the man who was absolutely dominant with us in Atlanta last year, he ends up signing through 2039 with the Houston Astros. So both him and Zach... Ne oh, never mind. What am I saying? Houston's in the NL now in the Southern Division. What am I saying? So we will not be seeing him, but he is back in the Southern Division, taking on his former team of the Atlanta Braves in that division. Uh, but yeah, big big deal for him. They did get it under $30 million, but I mean, even under $30 million, I was not willing to bring him back simply because he's a fragile pitcher, and that's just a disaster waiting to happen. And then just a couple more things here before we move on to the start of this season. Just quickly looking through the, uh, the, the predicted standings here in the American League Metro Division. The Yankees and the Mets are projected to both win 88 games. It's going to be a New York summer here in 2033. And then in the American League Pacific, the A's and the Mariners are both projected to win 95-plus games. Giants, then the Dodgers, then us. I don't know why they think we're going to win 78 games. I think that's pretty insane. You know, maybe they think we drop down because we don't have smith Shaver this year. Who knows? But I think we still have a very, very good team. I would be extremely surprised if we win 78 games. I think that's ridiculous. Just for whatever reason, we never get any respect in the top hitters or the top pitchers here. But I think we have a very, very solid team. And like I said, I'd be extremely surprised if we only win 78 games. Whereas on the National League side of things, the Guardians and the Tigers are both projected to get 95-plus wins. And then the Miami Marlins, the Royals, and the Cardinals all projected to get 90-plus wins in the Southern Division. And the Cardinals, their staff definitely has taken a hit this season. They've still got Jacob Mizorowski, who is in a first year with them. I guess they traded for him uh, at last year's deadline. Big-time stuff guy. Huge fastball slider combo here, both 80 grade. I mean, just the guy gets insane strikeout numbers. I mean, look at this stuff. Uh, they also have Mike Sidow, or Sido, the fireman, the lefty. He was a first-round pick for theirs in 2029 out of Oregon State. Weird, weird outlook here where he's really just a two-pitch guy. Looks like he's mainly been a bullpen guy for them, but he is getting a chance at the rotation here this season with the Zamora injury. And then obviously they traded us Lampkin last offseason. And then after those guys, it's Luke Pettit, who has had good seasons for them. But, you know, he is definitely a step down. And then they also got Garrett Crochet, 33 years old, wrecked. Definitely more of a reliever at this point. Uh, and, you know, not looking great to have a wrecked guy as your fourth starter. And then they have Camilo Doval, who is also wrecked. And, you know, he has had some decent starters years in the past, but... Not looking great when you have a wrecked guy as your fourth and your fifth starter. So, you know, they're projected to win 90-plus games, and we're projected to win 78. Bit, bit disrespectful, if you ask me. Especially when you account for the fact that when we take a look at the spring batting leaders, coming off a monster spring here is Chris Lesnar. Seven home runs, 16 ribbies, a 7-8-8 slug. The guy's on fire. On fire entering the season here. We're expecting big things. A lot of pop from this lineup. Oh, also, I forgot to mention who is the uh, the new staff. We have Kevin Cash, obviously, back. We had to hire a new assistant and GM. That's whatever. We also had to hire, uh, was it a pitching coach? I think it was a pitching coach and then both of our base coaches and then some minor league coaches and then our trainer. Or no, I think it might have just been our first base coach. I forget. But we, 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 we've got a bunch of guys who are, who are fine. You know, Strange Fields got, like, the outstanding development. Really good teaching in pretty much every position. Uh, you got our – yeah, this, this guy was on our team last year. So this guy is not new. 
our our trainer is new. He's got the legendary prevent arm and prevent legs with also some decent rehab on back and others. He's not as good as the other guy, obviously, but it's whatever. I, like I said, I biffed that in the offseason. Uh, and then our new pitching coach here is actually the former Cedar Rapids Colonels pitching coach. He has got the legendary aging with the excellent development and mechanics, excellent pitching. And when I signed him, or no, I think I think when I signed him, he did have average relationships. But what I liked was that he had excellent relationships and good relationships with the pitchers, especially Mike Hoskins, who we were, we were trying to get to be a very solid pitcher for us. So I'm thinking, you know, with this guy, you know, maybe we can work some magic here with this guy's development, his teach pitching. He's got an excellent relationship with Mike Hoskins, good relationships with a lot of our other guys. The only pitcher he's average with is Andrew Healy, which is like whatever. Andrew Healy's fine. He's going to get over it. It's not like he's going to all of a sudden fall off a cliff simply because he has an average relationship with a new pitching coach. You're an adult. Figure it out. 